like you to like to welcome you all here tonight for uh, the Arts and Sciences Distinguished Lecturer Series, and I'd like to ask the Dean of Art, the Arts and Sciences to come up and uh, present our Distinguished Lecturer for tonight, uh, Dean Kufadakis. Welcome on behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences to the 20th Distinguished Arts and Sciences Lecture at IPFW. Tonight it gives me a very distinct pleasure to present a plaque to a very good colleague of mine, a colleague who has been here for many years, a colleague who has devoted many exceptional years in teaching, service, and academic activity, not only for the students of this institution, but for his community at large. It is a distinct pleasure to present to him a plaque to remember, to commemorate this particular occasion. So David, on behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences, congratulations for all you have done. And many I'd like to ask Professor Dick Hess to do the introduction. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Dick Hess. I'm a member of the Department of Communication, and I've been asked, indeed, I've been given the distinct honor of introducing my colleague, David Fairchild, as the 1999 Distinguished Lecturer of the School of Arts and Sciences. David, as you know, is chairperson of the Department of Philosophy. Uh, he is truly a man of distinction. If you look in the uh, program for this evening, you will see there that he has five books. You'll also see there that David has more than 40 articles and has presented uh, to more than 20 international societies. That's what you see there. I want you to take a trip with me to David's office and we'll see what we see in David's office. Truth to be known, if you go in David's office and sit and look you will see a different David. You will see David the lover. David the lover. David the lover of truth. And that's witnessed by the books on his shelf, the journals. It's witnessed by the critical thinking classes he teaches our students, the logic classes he teaches our students. David the lover of truth. If you look on his walls, you'll see David, the lover of nature. He's a photographer. He is an individual who has photographs of outdoor scenes, of mountains, of, of lakes, uh, where he and Jan have vacationed. Uh, and and uh, that's a, a witnessing to David, the lover of nature. You'll also see, as you glance around his office, David, the lover of sport. And the witnesses there are the photographs of the athletic teams, the IPFW athletic teams that he has mentored as the NCAA compliance officer for this campus in the past. And you'll also see there other memorabilia, uh, recognition of his support of IPFW teams through the Royal Dons Club. Uh, and I tease him about this all the time. Plaques and memorabilia of his support for Purdue University West Lafayette athletic teams. Now there's one photograph in particular that's relevant to tonight's discussion. It is a photograph, I think it's immediately above his desk. It's a photograph that he took during the Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles a few years back. And if memory serves me correctly, it's a photograph of Flo jo competing so well as she did and winning one of the heats, one of, the heats of, of that uh, Summer Olympic game. 
it is it is a very interesting testimony to David's love of athletics. David is an athlete, believe it or not. He's a runner. He's a long distance runner. He has personally competed in long distance running athletic competitions. He's also a long distance runner in this sense. David is a long distance runner who challenges his personal best, his students' personal best, and his colleagues' personal best as we confront our daily work. As a philosopher of sport, he strives to understand the transcendent nature of sport in our society and in the world. Tonight, David has been asked to share his thinking with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Fairchild, 1999 Arts and Sciences Distinguished Lecturer, sharing with us his views on this subject. Still throwing like a girl, a philosopher looks at sex testing, gender confusion, and flojo. David? I do have some brief prepared opening comments, but before I get to those, in deference to Dick's comments about uh, how I am a bit of an athlete, I will tell you that being distinguished lecturer has done nothing to improve my eye-hand coordination <laughs> and that salad dressing on my knee. <laughs> Thank you, Van, for the plaque and the recognition. And to Dick, a longtime and very good friend, for a gracious and generous introduction. Thank you. I am honored and privileged to be here this evening. I am honored that my esteemed colleagues recognize the mutually fructifying interconnection between my teaching and my scholarship. I am privileged to share in this public forum some of my scholarship with my students my colleagues, my friends, and my family. I extend a special thank you for this recognition to the Faculty Affairs Committee, to my colleagues in the School of Arts and Sciences, and across the campus. To all of you here this evening, I extend a warm welcome and thank you for coming. Now, my somewhat more prepared remarks, I do want to acknowledge just a few very special people. Steve Hollander was a colleague and a friend for nearly 30 years. He provided us a model of professional integrity and courage. Wilburn Llewellyn is a graceful and gentle man and a constant inspiration. My wife Jan knows some of the dark and lonely places in my life and makes them less frightening. And to my daughter Emily and her husband Nate, who surprised me at dinner tonight unexpectedly from West Lafayette, a special thank you for coming here this evening. Now, still throwing like a girl? The philosopher Aristotle devoted much of book six of his Nicomachean Ethics to developing and demonstrating phronesis, practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is concerned with things human, with things about which it is possible to deliberate. Practical wisdom is interested in resolving concrete normative questions about what we ought to do. It involves the detailed exploration of the meaning, significance, and pragmatic relevance of normative principles applied to everyday situations. Developing practical wisdom requires describing situations, both real and imagined, 
as a prelude to applying the principles. The 20th century British philosopher G.E. Moore, writing in this tradition, believed he was obligated to repudiate positions he determined were inconsistent with common sense. Wilfred Sellers, a contemporary philosopher of science, provides an articulation of the specific context within which I situate my comments. I'm quoting now from Sellers. When we speak of philosophy, we are talking about the attempt to see how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. My scholarship over the last two decades has attempted to extend this characterization of philosophy not as the restricted exclusive province of professional academic philosophers, but as the arena for those who seek better to understand how things hang together. We do more than just read others' philosophic arguments, of course. We participate dialogically in them. Moreover, we participate in and mold the cultural environments that spawn our arguments. Thus, we are directly responsible for understanding and reforming the arguments, and then for appreciating and transforming the culture in which those arguments are enjoined. This evening's title plays on the title of Iris Young's groundbreaking 1977 phenomenology of female situatedness in sport. Descriptive phenomenology, developed most fully by Merleau-Ponty in the Phenomenology of Perception, emphasizes the ordinary purposive orientation of the cognizing body subject toward things it encounters and toward its environment. Sport is a uniquely appropriate locus for our descriptive explorations because it is a highly visible, usually public, cultural form. Not only is sport likely to be more accessible to analysis than certain other aspects of our culture at large, but as sport philosopher John Hoberman notes, high performance sport has become the most popular dramatic representation of human achievement. Hoberman articulates a belief more commonly held than philosophically achieved that elite sports persons influence and shape our ideas of what we as human beings can and ought to be, how we ought to look, and how we ought to behave. My presentation this evening addresses this belief. I first consider one sex testing incident and some of the philosophic issues arising therefrom, and then some specific gender issues arising from women's bodybuilding. Maria Patino withdrew from the 1985 World University Games hurdles competition just prior to the event. Patino, then 24 years old, was Spain's best female hurdler and national record holder. She had evidently injured herself during her warm-up and would not run. Subsequent to the games, Spanish national athletic officials urged Patino to retire from international competition. She refused. As her story became public, what might have been accepted as just another case of an injured athlete refusing to acknowledge the severity of a career-ending injury was recognized as something very different. Patino had not been physically injured at all. She had failed a buccal smear, gender validation, or sex test. In the eyes of the World Games Competition Committee, she was not really female. She withdrew from World Games Competition on the advice of Games track officials who wished to conceal what really occurred. Because Patino refused to retire graciously from competition, Spanish track officials revoked her scholarships, moved her out of the National Athletic Residence, erased all her track records, and reassigned her coach. 
How could this have happened? Patino throughout her life had thought of herself as unquestionably female. She never guessed there was anything unusual about her life until she failed the buccal smear test. Shocked and confused, Patino sought a medical explanation. The diagnosis was androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS. AIS is a congenital condition and one of the more common intersex states, affecting approximately one in every 20,000 women. Women with AIS have the same XY chromosome structure as males, but because of their condition, they are unable to respond to testosterone. AIS women lack a uterus and or ovaries, but typically develop such secondary sexual characteristics as height, musculature, percentage and distribution of body fat, and breast size, the general appearance of which fall comfortably within the range demonstrated by women with a normal female XX chromosome structure. Patino, because she was androgen insensitive, was genetically a male but by gender, a female. Gender verification tests have been used at elite competitions, including the World Games and the Olympics, since the 1960s. There has been some limited discussion of revising testing protocols to make them less demeaning to female athletes. The buccal smear, or chromosome test, was introduced to preclude female athletes from disrobing before a panel of predominantly older males responsible for determining whether they were sufficiently female to participate in women's competition. The buccal smear requires only a small sample of tissue scraped from inside the cheek. You know, the procedure is painless, minimally intrusive, and relatively non-demeaning. It is a reasonably accurate method for determining gender, provided that sex can be equated with gender and that all females have two X chromosomes and all males have one X and one Y chromosome. The buccal smear is not accurate, however, under either of two circumstances. First, if sex and gender are not identical concepts, any test predicated on their assumed identity will be unreliable and misleading. Second, there is a wide range of normal secondary sex characteristics demonstrated across the general population. This range is likely to be approximated among the athletic population. If so, then some athletes may demonstrate well-developed secondary sex characteristics at the far ends of the range even though they are chromosomally normal. And some athletes may demonstrate secondary sex characteristics that fit the norm for persons whose chromosomal sex is opposite to theirs. As Patino's case demonstrates, women with unusual genetic conditions who clearly are female in their own beliefs and bodies, in their athletic ability and accomplishments, and in the culturally conditioned gender roles they live, are likely to be unjustly disqualified from athletic competition. The International Amateur Athletic Federation, IAAF, recognizing these shortcomings, has returned to a physical examination rather than chromosome analysis to validate gender. The IAAF maintains that the absence of a penis and scrotum is sufficient to validate an athlete as a woman. Validation can be provided by a Federation certified physician who witnesses the athlete providing a urine sample. This may seem reasonable on a certain common sense level, provided that a person's gonads represent the true sex and are responsible for determining the individual's gender identity. The International Olympic Committee, IOC, 
argues that forcing female athletes to undress even partially before a physician witness is unjustifiably demeaning and still uses buccal smear laboratory tests. The test introduced at the 1992 Summer Games in Barcelona and subsequently used in Lillehammer, Atlanta, and Nagano, not yet determined for the Summer Games upcoming, used polymerase chain reaction analysis, PCR. PCR, which became part of the public lexicon with the O.J. Simpson trial, is a gene amplification technology in which millions of copies of DNA segments can be produced for analysis. It is less likely than earlier tests to yield false positives. Initial appearances to the contrary notwithstanding, however, the IOC and IAAF positions are conceptually similar. Both maintain that structure, whether sexual or genetic, is somehow more real as a determinant of gender than is process. That biological effects are more likely to be static and irreversible than are social or cultural effects. Both positions are predicated on an assumption of static and dichotomized concepts of body sex, body slash sex, and gender. But if these concepts are malleable, culturally constituted, and continuously evolving, as numerous researchers maintain, then no specific testing procedures will guarantee sex segregated athletic competition. Consider just four issues raised by the Patino case. Issue number one. The case demonstrates the failure of the technologies employed to sex screen athletes as well as the theoretical inadequacies on which these technologies are based. Patino's case was not a technological failure. It was a failure of the technology. The test provided exactly what it was supposed to provide, a determination that Maria Patino was genetically male. Procedures and protocols, of course, are always conceived, designed, developed, applied, and justified contextually. Gender verification tests are not computer simulations. They are always performed on individual athletes in specific situations with specific consequences. Typically, the gender in which one presents oneself throughout a lifetime is rightly accepted by others. There is no need to ask for gender verification, no stimulus for doing so, and no benefit to be gained therefrom. The need for gender verification testing arises only on an assumption that some men will try to sneak into women's sports events with a presumed unfair male advantage. That the risk of such gender cheating is at best minimal is attested by the fact that there has been only one clear-cut case of a man competing as a woman in the all of Olympic Games history. In the absence of philosophically substantive theorizing on sex and gender, any gender distinctions are likely to be arbitrary and problematic. If we are unsure why we are testing or what we are testing for, we will be unsure of what our results signify. On appeal to the IOC, Patino was reinstated, ruled eligible to compete, and issued a new certificate of femininity, exempting her from any further Olympic gender testing. Three months after her 1989 reinstatement, she set a Spanish national record in the indoor hurdles. Patino's case is particularly ironic in that she had passed a buccal smear test at the 1983 World Championships in Helsinki, but had not brought her certificate of femininity to Japan. Theoretically, any athlete 
possessing such a certificate is sufficiently feminine in the eyes of sport governing bodies to be exempted from further gender validation testing. I am not confident, however, that being required to produce a certificate prior to competition on pain of retesting is any less demeaning for the female athlete than submitting to the initial chromosome testing protocol or removing her clothing before a sex determination committee or providing a witnessed urine sample. Second issue. The Patino case focuses on femininity and masculinity as specifically gender issues. Gender, as Stephanie Rieger reminds us, is something we enact, not an inner core or constellation of traits we express. It is a pattern of social organization that structures the relations, especially the power relations, between men and women. Gender is not a thing. Gender is not an entity. Gender is a socially constructed relationship which cannot be adequately understood apart from such other social relationships as race, class, and ethnicity with which it is systematically and pragmatically interlocked. It is a cultural terrain in which meanings are always subject to context and redefinition. Contested terrain is a term from Michael Messner. Sorting out gender's meanings and the philosophic and cultural implications of the meanings we constitute is a major challenge. There are no quick nor easy answers here. Conclusions about gender accepted solely on the basis of biological, physiological, or genetic characteristics alone are insufficient to resolve gender issues. Third major issue. The gender identification issues raised by such intersex states as AIS suggest revised contexts in which to consider performance enhancing substances and tests for the detection thereof. Hoberman argues that the use of performance enhancers raises questions about human self-transformation in pursuit of unlimited performance and the self-imposed limits we are willing to consider thereon. These issues transcend science and technology per se. Two quite specific types of questions arise here. The first issue concerns what it means to test female or male. Women with the XX chromosome pattern who dope with testosterone are likely to develop side effects such as increased muscle mass and facial hair. AIS women, however, will show no such effects from the drugs. Gender verification testing is, of course, performed on female athletes only. Men with an XX chromosome pattern may appear stereotypically masculine. If they dope with testosterone, they can expect increased muscle mass and facial hair as drug side effects. While these athletes are subject to drug testing for performance enhancement, they are not subject to gender verification testing. They may continue to compete as men even though they are genetically female. In this context, what does it mean to test positive for anabolic androgenic steroid use? Other intersex conditions pose equally difficult challenges for the gender theorist. Genetic male hermaphrodites, for example, have ambiguous external genitalia. Typically raised as girls until about age 12, when normal testosterone production at puberty results in substantial virilization, these individuals usually switch gender identity from female to male. Turner syndrome individuals, approximately 40% of whom have one unmatched X chromosome, also typically are identified as female at birth 
on the basis of female external genitalia, but are actually neuter. In some cases, the genitals are so ambiguous at birth that surgical construction is needed to make a gender determination. In both types of cases, the initial gender identification is made primarily because of the inadequacy of our cultural dichotomous classification for sex. It is difficult to know how many elite athletes have been disqualified from competition as a result of gender verification tests because data from test failures is not publicized. By Olympic statute, test results are reported only to the IOC medical director and the chairman of the IOC medical commission. Gender verification tests are never made public. Thus, our only mechanism for determining whether athletes have been disqualified for failing gender tests is the athlete's own choice to go public. The IOC has banned only about a dozen Olympic athletes for being insufficiently feminine from the 1968 Mexico City Games to the 1992 Barcelona Games. If half the athletes at Atlanta in 1996 were female, the ratios of gender deviations would suggest that perhaps five to ten of them were at some risk for gender disqualification. To date, the only publicized case of gender testing concerned the Bulgarian women's weightlifting team, all members of which were tested and all determined to be sufficiently feminine to compete. I have been unable to find any reports of gender disqualification from the Atlanta Games, even within the Olympic Medical Commission archives. The second type of question concerns testing for genetic determined performance enhancing conditions. Adrenal hyperplasia, for example, affects about one in 14,000 persons. In this condition, the adrenal glands produce an excess of male hormones. Increased muscle mass is an expected side effect of this condition. Women with adrenal hyperplasia will test normal under PCR analyses for sex, but may in fact have an unfair advantage over other women athletes due to their drug-induced increased musculature. Should our notions of gender verification testing be expanded to include adrenal hyperplasia? More generally, we know that any athlete's height, weight, body mass, musculature, VO2 max, and so forth are significantly influenced by genetics. In short, by how well they chose their parents. Since these characteristics contribute directly to the athlete's power and strength, speed and endurance, we can conclude that these performance parameters are also genetically influenced, at least indirectly. If we learn to isolate specific genetic factors that contribute, say, 200 meter dash speed, should we test for those factors? Should we segregate competition on genetic speed? How are we even to understand such questions? On what criteria should we develop an answer? What should we do with any answer we develop? The final issue I'll note here involves our cultural treatment of elite athletes as what Hoberman calls charismatic role models. Athletes now influence and shape our ideas of what a human being can and ought to be precisely because high performance sport has become the most popular dramatic representation of human achievement. We ordinary persons develop our understanding of what we ought to look like and how we ought to behave by considering and appraising athletes' achievements. Concern for what a person is, can, and ought to be is clearly a feminist concern because, as noted, only females are tested. Testing only female competitors is a pragmatic demonstration of an androcentric reality a reality in which men have been responsible for establishing the conceptual structures in and through which sport is appreciated. 
as we will see shortly, certain values the culture expects to reinforce through sport may be denied to women, especially those values emphasizing self-development. Gender verification testing provides some answers to the questions we ask, but it obviously does not provide answers to the questions that are not asked but ought to be. How are we to understand gender? What genetic, physical, or other traits define woman? What genetic, physical, or other traits define man? What does it mean to be feminine? What does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be a female athlete? What does it mean to be a male athlete? What do these questions mean? Such questions deliberately challenge the status quo. There is no philosophically substantive justification for a simple dichotomous view of sex. Sexual dualism and dimorphism, like feminine gender and masculine gender, is not a dichotomy, but a continuum. Sexual and gender, and gender dualism is socially constructed in such a way that it appears to be an immutable fact, but it is not because elite sport, through repeated iterations of testing protocols, continues to emphasize dichotomized notions of sex and gender, we must ask after the real reason for such testing. The very commitment to test at all requires gender dichotomy and masks two cultural assumptions. That real feminine women are not capable of sporting excellence, and that any woman who is well-muscled and does not meet conventional socio-cultural standards of femininity is gender suspect. A failure, or worse, a refusal to recognize and challenge such assumptions helps to produce at least tacit consent and support for the status quo in which gender verification testing is an accepted practice for women athletes. I conclude this first half of my discussion with an admission. Sex and gender are such complicated conceptual issues that I have only begun the requisite philosophic description. Gender verification testing, if it can be justified at all, awaits a substantive philosophic understanding of embodiment and the consequent agreement to apply that understanding to extant sport arenas. I now turn my attention to issues of embodiment. Philosophers as far back as Plato and Socrates have been concerned with the nature of the self. The classic Platonic or Cartesian dualist tradition represents the self as some combination of mind, consciousness, spirit, and body. The primary focus of the self is found in the mind or the soul, which is ontologically and epistemologically distinct from the body which it uses, possesses, or trains. This tradition leads to at least three different but related perspectives on the body. The body may be body as object for others. Here, my primary understanding of my body is found only as it is reflected through my assumptions about others' expectations of and for it. I have a body, and that body can be developed, molded, and shaped to meet the expectations others hold for it. This is common among athletes who seek to satisfy a coach's expectation of strength and size. The body may also be viewed as my body as object, in which case I view my body as if it were simply an object apart from myself, one thing among other things in my universe. This also is common among athletes, partly scientific, emphasizing the physiological and kinesiological parameters of training, and partly epistemological, having to know the appropriate training regimen to determine the amount of effort required to master a task. And finally, and most helpfully, I may view my body phenomenologically as my body as subject, or body subject, the radical root of my personal reality. This view understands my body as myself, I am my body. Here my body manifests myself in the world. It is only and necessarily through the lived body 
the core vesu, that the world is opened to the self. <clears throat> the body subject is the experience of my body as it is disclosed to me in my immediate involvements and concerns. My experience of selfness is indissolubly linked with those existential projects radiating from my body as it is actually lived. This is a dramatic evolution from dualism. My lived body is not a conceptual entity, neither material nor spiritual. It is an orientation, a stance, which is part and parcel of the pre-objectified world prior to any kind of scientific categorizations, cultural dichotomizations, or philosophic theorizing. The lived world is primarily and fundamentally a social world, and this results in the experience of my body subject as coextensive with my experience of the body of the other. The other's body is always a factor in my world. It may be an obstacle to be overcome, as in a sport contest, an instrument for my use, as in a choral performance or dance, or as an opportunity for authentic communication or personal fulfillment, as in marriage. As my body is my project of being in the world, so the other's body is her project of being in the world. Since I do not live her body, I cannot penetrate her project of being in the world. But I can and must apprehend and describe her project as it exists for me. The other is inescapable. I must relate to her. My choice is not whether to relate, but only whether to relate authentically or inauthentically. Authentic relating cannot be complete, however, because I do not constitute the other I encounter her. Authenticity is most likely when I acknowledge the other as a subject with the existential projects of her own, when I am co-present in her projects, and when we mutually acknowledge our individual freedoms. Body subjects, what P.F. Strawson calls persons, living their projects in communities of others are both opaque and partially concealed and open, dwelling in the world capable of and obligated to develop personal meaning in the process of manifesting themselves. Although substantive issues related to gendered sport are found at all levels in all sport, they are most dramatically represented in bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is an especially significant focus for consideration of gender issues in sport for a variety of reasons. The widely recognized bodybuilder somatype popularized by the American gladiators in various contemporary televised and cinematic portrayals, both actual and fictional, is to some degree a masculine parody, even a caricature, in which the surface of the body becomes both the subject and the object of an anatomical gaze. No consideration is given to intellectual or consciousnessly related aspects of the bodybuilder self, either in competition or during training nor is any serious consideration given to the use of certain chemical compounds believed to enhance muscular development or other health-related considerations, including extreme dietary practices designed to reduce body fat to something less than 5% on day of competition. Second, it is both obvious and profound that this body cannot be developed accidentally. Obvious? as attested by the small percentage of the population that achieves the requisite bulk and definition, and profound because such an achievement represents an existentially committed choice, a project undertaken by a lived body in a social context. Women's oppression in Western societies, however defined and to whatever extent, is in some measurable part rooted in the social construction of their bodies. Bodybuilding itself challenges many of the prevailing cultural ideologies regarding bodies and selves. Some women bodybuilders may be redefining our understanding of the feminine by deliberately rejecting culturally normative images of woman. For most bodybuilders, the body is wholly partable and bounded, distinguished by the various muscle groups that must be individually worked and developed. These individuals typically understand themselves in paradigmatically Cartesian ways. They see their bodies as bodies as subjects for others, as objects apart from themselves. 
The bodybuilder sees her body made up of parts, chest, back, arms, legs, each to be further subdivided for training, traps front, traps rear. The word see is especially important here. Bodybuilding is a visual medium. It is not just the contests that provide opportunities for bodybuilders to present the self to themselves and others. It is the weight room. Bodybuilders use mirrors to ensure that they are isolating the appropriate muscle group, but also to deliberately promote self-objectification. Mirroring represents an exaggerated form of philosophic alienation and objectification. The visual character of this sport is the locus through which women bodybuilders are frequently rendered degendered or sexually indeterminate. The difficulty of attaining a redefinition under these circumstances is attested by the shifting standards in judging for women's contests. It has long been accepted in men's contests that within weight classes, size matters. Given symmetry and form, line and musculature, the larger the man, the better. The more prominent the pecs, the broader the shoulders, the big guy wins. Alan Gutmann, in a provocative work on the erotic element in sport, goes so far as to claim that the muscularity of the Greek athlete approximates a nearly universal ideal masculine body. No such general standard has been accepted for women's contests. There is continuing discussion across the sport and among the judges at individual contests. The 11 judges at International Federation of Bodybuilders events, that's IFBB, are expected by charter to meet prior to the contest to determine the standards by which the winner in that contest will be selected. Whether she is the most muscular and ripped woman or the woman with the softest musculature or the woman with the most stereotypically feminine curves is determined on a per contest basis. Female competitors thus must prepare for competitions without knowing which criteria the judges will emphasize. The sporting body subject in all sports provides a philosophically accessible site for investigating the interaction of power and knowledge. Since it is now widely recognized that all knowledge is gender contingent, what we learn from our sport-specific investigations will have implications for the constitution of knowledge and the distribution of power across the culture more generally. Female bodybuilding embodies the tensions and contradictions among femininity, masculinity, size, strength, and muscularity. Bodybuilding was founded and is organized, governed, operated, and judged primarily by males who have the power to set and maintain all standards requisite for the sport. Within the sport, quoting one male judge, men's ability to formulate and maintain gender definitions is enhanced, serving to regulate women's behavior, I would add, and support gender inequality. You may be more familiar with the film Pumping Iron 2 than with the sport of women's bodybuilding. The film exemplifies a number of significant issues. Pumping Iron 2 was the 1984 successor to the 1977 film Pumping Iron, the documentary the 1976 Mr. Olympia Contest. The original film is now, of course, a cult classic since it introduced Arnold Schwarzenegger to the American public, not only as a cultural icon, but a budding movie star. The first film raised no questions about what the ideal body should be, nor did it raise any questions about the interconnected systems of race and class that define cultural expectations in any historic period. Such questions were addressed consistently in the second film, which was less a documentary than a cinematic presentation of subplots concerning femininity and heterosexuality, a difference from the first film that cannot be overstated. Given dynamic judging standards in the sport, the announcement of the winner is almost always suspenseful in women's contests. To be both female and strong, feminine and muscular, is to challenge and perhaps reconstitute dominant codes of femininity by explicitly violating traditional codes of feminine identity. Female bodybuilders 
create a sort of cultural gender hybrid, a masculine muscularity of ripped biceps and bulging gastrocs, but accented with facial makeup, long hair, and often surgically enhanced breasts. The issue of what a woman is is consistently subject to revaluation and redefinition. The judges and Pumping Iron too agree in their required meeting that the winner's most important aspect is shape, a feminine shape. The majority of the female characters in the film, including the one female judge, worry that a redefinition of femininity emphasizing size and muscularity will entail a loss of traditionally understood love, female power, and privilege. Three of the major players in the film, Rachel McLeish, Bev Francis, and Carla Dunlap, have significant males in their lives. The film cultivates an image of heterosexuality for these three women. Francis, first seen wall walking in her hotel corridor, is large, muscular, and very strong. Early in the film, she deadlifts 510 pounds. Throughout the film, she represents the negative stereotype of women who look like men. There is an almost constant emphasis on her manlike physique, and her poses are adapted from men's poses. McLeish, first seen as a casino showgirl, is a beauty queen bodybuilder, strong and smoothly muscular, but still sexy in a bikini. Her poses are derived from those used by fashion models. Dunlap, the so-called surprise contest winner, is a compromise on the issue of muscularity and sexy femininity. Neither as large and prominently muscled as Francis, nor as stereotypically pretty as McLeish, Dunlap allows the contest judges to maintain their hegemonic standards of femininity. The first Gold's Gym scene features a number of women lifting, but neither Francis nor Dunlap is seen here. The scene then shifts to a featured body parts shower scene, unimaginable and unnecessary in the men's film, and then shifts to the women lounging around the outside pool, also unimaginable and unnecessary in the men's film. Pumping Iron 2 has but one veiled and ambiguous reference to drug use for sculpting musculature. McLeish says of Francis, the question is not how she did it, but where she's at right now. The judges never raise the issue of drug use and admittedly ignore the issue of breast implants, claiming they are too hard to detect. They deem body alteration through padded costume illegal, however, consistent with the IFBB code, and require McLeish to change her costume immediately prior to the final pose-off because her bra had two layers of fabric. Drug use among bodybuilders is a prominent arena in which to find hegemonic notions about the relationship between femininity and muscularity. Published data indicate that in 1993, approximately 25 to 60 percent of female competitors used steroids to enhance their muscularity. By 1997, only four years later, that number had risen to 70%. Estimates of drug use among male bodybuilders range as high as 100%. The IFBB requires all competitors either be randomly tested for drug use, which never happens, or that all competitors at sanctioned contest be tested prior to the competition, IFBB requirement. Sanctions for drug use range from disqualification from that event for first violation to lifetime bans from all IFBB sanctioned events for a third violation. But drug testing is the sole responsibility of event promoters. The IFBB does not test for drugs. The IFBB, in its official position, urged drug testing for women in 1985, five years before it even suggested drug testing for men, and has been much more rigorous in testing women than it has for men, reaching its most rigorous applications following the 1992 Ms. Olympia contest. 
The issue of judging inconsistency with its subtext of drug use reached its nadir during the 1991-92 season in which opposite looks won in two successive contests. The 1991 Ms. Olympia contest, which was televised live on ESPN, a first for women's bodybuilding, rewarded women who were big, ripped, and cut. The winner, Linda Murray, was the most shredded competitor and one of the largest women in the sport. The next women's professional competition was the 1992 Ms. International, and here the judges rewarded a smoother, softer look. The winner, Anya Schreiner, was a fitness competitor and one of the least muscular women in the contest. Murray did not even place in the top six. IFBB judges are not at all reluctant to express their concern about the relationship between muscularity and drug use. One nationally prominent female judge claims, quote, it seems women have gone too far. They look offensive. I personally don't feel men need to be tested because you're talking about a man injecting a male hormone into his body. I'm not saying steroids are right, but they're more right when a man's doing them than a woman. <laughs> this is a striking example of the extent to which women's bodies are indeed Mesner's contested terrain. IFBB bylaws require that contestants wear very small bikinis, quote, that conform to accepted standards of taste and decency, revealing the abdominal muscles as well as the back muscles. The two pieces of the bikini must be fastened together with two strings, and the fasteners as well as the bikini must not consist of metallic material or padding." Unquote. Yet surgical breast implants are legal, and judges frequently suggest that competitors get them. Numbers run as high as 80% of female competitors have been surgically altered. Judges continue to look for a feminine shape in the words of a nationally prominent female judge, quote, I'd like to see some cleavage. Not a lot, because I think at that level of low body fat, 3%, somebody with 38 C's up there looks kind of silly. But I would like to see some fullness. I don't want to see it flat. I don't want to see the bikini top wrinkled where there's nothing in it. I'd like to see a woman who has taken the time and effort to put on a good face arrange your hair in a nice, feminine way. The cultural concern, obviously, is that certain women, identified by their appearance, are not really women. All the women in Pumping Iron 2 were, in fact, competitive bodybuilders, but they have enjoyed very different success since the film's release. McLeish, who won both 1980 and 82 Ms. Olympia contest, finished second in 1984, and never again finished in the top 20. She is now retired and a modestly successful actress. Frances, who was not among the film's finalists, placed 10th in 1986 behind Dunlap's 9th, 3rd in 87, 88, and 89, second in 90 and 91, and then retired. Dunlap, the film's winner, placed third in 1984, fourth in 1985, ninth in 1986, twelfth in 1987, tenth in 1988, and quit. Francis is now widely identified as an example of a too muscular woman who crossed the line towards excessive masculine muscularity, a woman who, quote, looks a lot like a male with a wig on and a female suit. That's from a female judge. Another female judge speaks, about, speaks openly about women who are just too big. Female bodybuilders, this is a quote, have become so muscular that men no longer want to look at them and women no longer want to look like them. Perhaps we should not be surprised at this level of contested terrain. Women's bodybuilding has been recognized as a legitimate sport with governing bodies, codified structures, and prize money only since 1978, and the Ms. Olympia contest has been sanctioned only since 1980. Concerns about our cultural responses to strong, muscular, athletic women are not restricted to bodybuilders. The cover story in the January-February 1999 issue of Women's Sports and Fitness is titled, The New Ideal, What Makes a Body Beautiful? The story presents results of a national survey 
of people presented with four body types. A skinny model, a toned body but with plenty of curves, a strong but not overly muscled sports figure, and a hardcore hard body. 62% of the men and 55% of the women selected the curvaceous toned body as the ideal. The sports figure body finished second, selected by 30% of the women and 20% of the men. The bodybuilder finished a distant third and indeed was selected last by 47% of the women and 58% of the men. In an interview in the same issue, Cami Granato, a member of the 1988 Women's Olympic gold medal hockey team, claims, quote, I like to look good when I play, and makeup sends the message that athletes can be feminine and still play the game aggressively. Not only are women athletes judged by and through a male gaze, we find that masculinity and femininity are maintained as oppositional concepts presented through continually hegemonic notions of femininity and masculinity, thus institutionally controlling female competitors' bodies in bodybuilding or other sports in gender-specific ways. Consider very briefly one other film. Personal Best was released in 1982 at the height of the running boom. It purported to be about elite female track athletes as they contested for limited spots on the 1976 and 1980 U.S. Olympic teams. It featured two pentathletes who meet during trials competition, become friends and then lovers, separate and then meet again at the subsequent trials. Almost all the athlete characters in the film were portrayed by real track and field athletes except for the lead character, Chris, who is played by Marielle Hemingway. Chris is presented as stereotypically and heterosexistly feminine, with long blonde hair and a girlishly unassertive presence. Tori, who was played by real-life pentathlete Patrice Donnelly, has short hair, square features, wears tailored jackets, and always takes the initiative in sexual encounters with Chris. Subsequently, Tori is jealous when Chris is with men and lurks around the background after the two separate. The film is significant for this discussion because its treatment of the two women presents the commonly expected heterosexist other side of patriarchal depictions of female athletes. Even the casting in this film reaffirms a heterosexist position. Mariel Hemingway, a young and vibrant but then non-athletic actress trained for nearly one year to achieve some athletic grace and fluidity in her movement to add realism to her training and racing scenes. The producers concluded that Patrice Donnelly, a real athlete who had no acting experience, could be trained to act and had her, quote, play herself, quote, as a, quote, butch lesbian character but they were unable to find even one long-haired, blonde, real track athlete who could train for a year to play herself as a heterosexual track athlete character. Once the film was distributed, Hemingway, then only 19 years old, quit training, deliberately lost her musculature, got breast implants, and was subsequently cast in a sex kitten role in the film Star 80. Hemingway has recently had the breast implants removed, has adopted a homeopathic diet, and is now intensely athletic following a regimen of yoga, hiking, snowshoeing, and snowboarding. It is profoundly saddening that an actress who 17 years ago played an athlete in a film has only recently developed an appreciation of her own fully personed female athleticism. Patriarchal representations of the female body with all the attendant culturally developed behavioral expectations have not yet accepted even in this year preceding the millennium successful, strong, muscular female athletes as individuals, as persons who have chosen their own existential projects 
and comfortably live their bodies. Although current bodybuilding is almost totally unconcerned with issues of race and ethnicity, it is still concerned with heterosexist and hegemonic issues of femininity. The sport is undecided, conflicted, as to how to respond to a builder who calls herself Rene Tone. Tone may or may not be a surgical transsexual. Although the rumors are widespread, she neither confirms nor denies. She is large, well-muscled, and wears her hair very short. The competitive bodybuilding community is reluctant, indeed has refused to allow her to compete as a female, both because of a publicly expressed concern that she may once have been a male and because she is, quote, so obviously and clearly butch. Tone herself refuses to compete against men. Florence Griffith Joyner may well be America's best known female athlete. As a college scholarship athlete, Flojo was the 1982 NCAA 200 meter champion, the 1983 NCAA 400 meter champion, and helped set an American record with the 4x400 relay team. While these are notable collegiate accomplishments, her times were not particularly impressive when measured against non-collegiate international competition. After graduating, Flojo won a silver medal in the 200 meter dash at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. Her time was solid, but not spectacular. Between 1984 and 1988, Flojo was publicly recognized less for her track accomplishments than for her public persona. During the 1987 World Championships, Flojo was the darling of television coverage in the States. Shots typically featured her tight racing suit, similar to those worn by speed skaters, her six inch fingernails painted with red and white stripes and stars, and her prominent musculature. Just prior to the Seoul Olympics, Flojo was featured in a 1988 cover story in US News and World Report. The story described in detail her beautiful nails, her hair, how long it took her to get dressed for competition, who made her tracksuit. The final sentence of the article noted her 200 meter time of 21.77 seconds. But it did not remark that that was the American record. Flojo went on to win four medals, including three gold at the 1988 Olympic Games. She did so with record setting times. Her Olympic record of 10.54 in the 100 meter dash and her world record of 21.34 in the 200 meter dash have not been equaled in the 10 years since they were set. Such media attention devoted to her female athletes hair, nails and clothing while barely mentioning record setting performances is both trivializing and marginalizing. A clear cut example of hegemonic standards of femininity for the female athlete qua athlete. Flojo's celebrity did not protect her from criticism about how her records were achieved. Her 1988 Olympic performances were so extraordinary, according to these criticisms, they simply could not have been achieved through hard work, self-sacrifice, intense training, personal discipline, and diet. They must have been chemically boosted. For the record, Flojo never tested dirty, in season or out, at trials or games. She was a consistent, outspoken advocate of drug-free competition and regularly visited schools where she urged youngsters to devote their energies to sports, not drugs. Her milk mustache was a highly featured, prominent displayed item in the successful American Dairy Council's advertising campaign for the last four years. Had Flojo been smaller, less muscular, these criticisms never would have arisen. She was criticized because she was too big, too muscled, too strong. Neither Flojo nor any other serious athlete about whom I know anything has ever been told to slow down 
the public thinks you run too fast. Flojo retired from competition after the 1988 games and devoted her energies to acting. Although she talked about a comeback at the 1992 and 96 games, injuries prevented her participation. Nonetheless, allegations of drug use continued through the 1996 Olympic trials. It is at least gender specifically curious that anabolic androgenic steroids were Olympic legal until the mid 1960s and were first tested as proscribed substances at the 1968 games. Buccal smear sex testing has been widely used only since the late 1960s. Steroids, thus, were proscribed at about the same time increased virilization among female athletes was seen to be problematic in sports. Flojo died in her sleep in mid-September 1998. Her death prompted much uninformed speculation that steroids at least indirectly caused her death. An autopsy established that she died from an epileptic seizure. But this result simply changed the focus of the speculation. The seizure was a consequence of her obvious long-term drug use. Little reported in the sports media and not at all reported in the mainstream electronic media was that Flojo had suffered from seizures for more than two years prior to her death. There is to this day no evidence that Florence Griffith Joyner ever used performance enhancing drugs. She was a gifted and hardworking athlete. Our cultural willingness to assume that statistically deviant accomplishments or body types must be unnatural directed against even the most talented, accomplished, and highly visible female athletes poses significant challenges for all of us. While the challenges are found easily in patriarchal cultures, resolutions may be more difficult. Can we develop a non-patriarchal representation of what the female body would and should be? Within the context of tonight's discussion, this challenge should be answered first in and for sport and then extended beyond sport. Sport is the appropriate starting point because it uniquely demonstrates and thus symbolizes human freedom, primary action, and a choice to play. Specific movements in sports are entirely freely chosen within the losery attitude definitive of sport. The extent to which sport is a humanizing activity is the extent to which it must be humanizing for all of us. The extent to which sport continues to define woman as the essential body object other is the extent to which we must embark on proactive endeavors to develop models and conceptions of sport that are non-masculinist, non-patriarchal, and non-dehumanizing. This is the challenge that awaits our further philosophic consideration. My comments this evening have been an exercise in descriptive phenomenology. I have not attempted to develop or articulate a complete theory. I have attempted to suggest a very general framework within which we better may understand infrequently considered aspects of frequently observed sport phenomena. Phenomenological description, careful looking, must precede any judgment, explanation, or theory construction because it precedes classification and systematization. Such description is not easy and probes the depths of familiar phenomena we too often believe are non-problematic. But such depth should not discourage us. As Edmund Husserl notes, we are led deeper and in the depths lie the obscurities and in the obscurities the problems. I will be pleased if my comments tonight have suggested some depth and continued the Socratic quest of helping make sense of our lives. My suggestions await extension, refinement, and articulated precision. Continuing efforts must be made to unpack and challenge the interconnections among race, 
class, and ethnicity at all levels of sport and to redefine our understanding of gender identity as developed and lived by situated persons. I close my comments with two brief illustrations that hint at reasons for cautious optimism concerning the challenges of extending my comments. First, there is a small but outspoken and well-placed movement to abandon gender verification testing in international competitions. Several governing bodies, including the IAAF, the International Track and Field Association, and the International Triathlon Association, have rewritten their bylaws to include statements opposing gender testing. Arne Lundqvist, a sports science expert, longtime member of the IOC's Medical Commission, and courageously outspoken proponent of eliminating gender testing from the Olympics, convinced the IOC in February 1998 to agree to consider leaving sex tests out of a new medical code. That code has yet to be written, but the agreement to consider doing so is a significant first step. Second, and finally, I offer one very brief example without elaboration. You have seen the recent television commercial for the WNBA featuring the Houston Comets' Cynthia Cooper, winner of the League MVP award in each of the WNBA's first two seasons. The commercial begins with tight shots of two men engaged in a stereotypically masculine playground mano a mano one-on-one -on -one basketball game. As a figure approaches the chain link fence surrounding the court, the television viewer can see the name Cooper on the back of her warm-up jacket. And then the viewer hears her yell to the men, y'all are playing like girls. The two men, insulted, stop playing, look toward the voice with irritated expressions, and then recognize Cooper. The commercial concludes as the two men say, thanks, and return to their game. Thank you. You've been a very indulgent audience to allow me to speak that long without interruption. Uh, I understand that by tradition there is some opportunity for questions and answers after these events. There is punch and cookies upstairs. Uh, I think we're supposed to be out of here by 9.15 or 9 o'clock or something like that. Uh, I would encourage those of you who have some questions to ask uh, and all of you to uh, make yourselves uh, enjoy punch and cookies. If I know anything more than I've already told you, I'll be happy to try and answer your questions, uh, but uh, no guarantees in this or other things in which I speak. Are there any questions on anything we've done? Peter? David, your last example was intriguing because it really sort of reflected another dimension or another force in determining the female athlete in terms of the body type and who she is. And that's the commodification of athleticism in terms of sport and how it becomes a money-making phenomenon. Um, do you see that as a significant force in terms of impacting how we define um, female athleticism? Significant does not have to be positive. And in that respect, I would say, yes, I do see it as a significant force. Uh, I like a lot of the things about the WNBA. And it provides nice opportunities for development of role models that counter some of the hegemonic notions of femininity and particularly female sports and so forth. Uh, I am less happy, however, that it's the WNBA and it's funded in large measure by the NBA. Arenas are, are focused from the NBA. The media marketing and personification of the athletes is done by the NBA. And that, I think, will perpetuate some of the, dis the cultural uh, distress that I feel relative to hegemonic uh, notions of, of sex and gender. But I think there is the potential there to be significant. Uh, perhaps my last comment on that point is the WNBA was directly responsible for the folding of the ABL, 
which did not have the backing uh, and media support of the NBA. And that perhaps indicates the extent to which it is likely to be significant, but not necessarily positive. It's a good question. So another question closer to the front. I wondered what you had planned in the future, um, if you had any goals for yourself or um, with your work at the university? That's two questions, goals for me and goals for my work at the university. Uh, my goals for me are to decide what I want to be when I grow up and someday perhaps I'll be able to do that. Uh, my goals for my continued work in the university uh, are to be the best damn teacher I can possibly be. Other questions? I can barely see that far. <laughs> what I understand from your lecture is that uh, you're making a proposition that if we take these gender verification tests out of uh, you know, these competitions from women athletes, isn't it unfair to the rest of the women athletic community if there are women who exist and enjoy shouldn't say enjoy, but if they're taking advantage, I mean, if they are, uh, have some tendencies which make them stronger than the rest of the women who are competing for the same competition? Why are we committed to believing that sex-segregated competition is somehow better than not? I'm not confident that's an appropriate kind of distinction for IOC or other uh, governing bodies to make. My sport is long distance running, and I will admit without the slightest blush of shame that I am regularly humiliated athletically by females for whom I have tremendous personal devotion, affection, and respect. And my athletic accomplishments, however meager they are, would be greatly diminished if I could run only in male segregated events or females could compete only in female segregated events. So I would challenge the very assumption that we ought to have sex segregated competitions in the first place. But given that, if you start testing for gender and sex, what are the criteria you're going to use to decide when you've got one? One sex, two, one gender, two, three genders, four. What criteria are you going to use and who gets eliminated and who gets kept? And I'm not sure there are answers to those questions. If we can find answers to those questions, I might be willing to reconsider the argument that we ought to have sex segregated competitions. But since I don't understand the question, not your question, my question, uh, let alone the kind of answers that might be developed, I'm not confident that we're going to get very far with that. It's an intriguing question, but I'm really not able to answer it very well. Develop a non hierarchical view of what women can and should be. Is there an answer to that question in your view? Uh, that's a sufficiently uh, friendly philosophic question that the easy answer is sure, we can do that. Uh, it'll take a better mind than mine and greater cultural and gender sensitivity than I have to do that, but yes, I think that's possible. Do I think that's going to happen in this society in my lifetime? No. Other questions? And the IOC has considered now for a year whether they should consider taking sex testing out of the code. They haven't even actually gotten down to the discussion yet. And they've been looking at it for a year. The IOC's bylaws allow, this changes the subject a little bit, allow the generosity of hospitality to the committee that makes the decisions about host cities to be interpreted by the host city. So if Fort Wayne wants to host the Olympic Games at some point and we decide that we'll spend $150 on every IOC member, that's our choice. If some other community, read between the lines Salt Lake City, chooses to spend $223,000 per IOC member, that's entirely legal. Now, if we can't even address that question, where we're going to go with a culturally more probative questions about what makes a male and what makes a female athlete and how we're going to sort the two of them out. So in my lifetime, probably not. Maybe in somebody's lifetime. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, for those of you who are students in my classes and haven't signed uh, the list and back, if you would please do that before you leave, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful time to be here.